Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into the hands, into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets with ram's horn in the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city. How many times? Seven times. With the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a what? A loud shout. When the wall of the city, I'm sorry, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Let's pray. Lord, we love you today. We ask you for an anointing on the word. Lord, we can say a bunch of awesome things, but ultimately we want your word to go into our hearts and illuminate your spirit within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, my message is entitled, Taking the Curve taking the curve. And this is a new message that I'm excited to preach to you today. I feel like there's a prophetic edge on it. And I hope my prayer is that this message will take you into 2015 and it will help define a season that you're in in such a way that you will go into January hearing God and you'll know this is what God is saying to me right now. And it will, it will propel you into the next season. You see, most of us get messed up on a few things in life, and most of it is not, not loving God well, it's not obeying God, it's, it's a few things that we mess up, and usually it's the things that we don't expect to mess up with God on. And I wanna kinda break this down, and I hope that you understand this. Now, I grew up in Tahoe. Did anybody grow up in a mountain town? How many of you have ever been into Tahoe before? How many of you know that if you live this close to Tahoe and you've not been to Tahoe, you are sinning? <laughs> I just want to say that over you. I hope you felt the shame when I said that. So I grew up in, I grew up in South Lake Tahoe and I grew up, um, I love South, I love Tahoe. I mean, I love Tahoe. I think the, the longer I've been away from Tahoe, the more when I go to Tahoe, I love it. I love the snow. I love the trees. I love the smell. I mean, how many of you just love when you go to Tahoe? And you know, when you go to Tahoe, there is something about it. It is like a wonderful mountain, clear, clean air, beautiful, just it's, it's, it's heavenly. I, something should be named up there, heavenly. I don't know. It's something. And, and so I love it. I love it. And, and even as I've gotten older, I love to bring my boys there. We go camping every 4th of July up there. I, I just, something about it brings back memories. I was on ski teams up there. I skied all, all my, my, my kid growing up. I, I camped. I, I mean, I just, I learned to ride my bike up there. I mean, we didn't have sidewalks. I mean, how many of you remember, like, we didn't, we, we grew up. I mean, when we woke up in the morning and you were cold, you started fire. Anybody grow up in the, how many of you grew up in cold weather? I mean, when you grew up in cold weather, you, the, when you got warm, it was when dad started a fire and, and you would wait in bed until someone started a fire. And then you just waited and you hoped to God that the fire would catch up with the house. <laughs> Do you remember that? You just wait. And then sometimes you would just back up to the fire and wait until you would get warm. And then you would hope that somebody would hurry up. I remember uh, we would wake up and there was a snowstorm. You would wait till somebody plowed your driveway to go to school. You would wait. And we had a neighbor that had a, had a plowing company and he would hopefully plow your driveway so that dad didn't have to get up there with the snow plow and drive your driveway, snow plow, dr whatever, <laughs> plow your driveway to get to school. I remember that very clearly. I mean, we learned to, ri to, to, to uh, learn to ride our bikes on gravel roads. Do you remember falling on gravel roads? It's not pavement. Do you remember, I mean, it was a type when you fell on a, on a gravel driveway, there were pieces of gravel that went into your skin and it never went away. Do you know what I mean? Like I have pieces of gravel in my skin that has never gone away. There is lumpy parts. It's not cellulite. It is just gravel. Do you know what I mean? Like, honey, what is that? It's just gravel. I grew up in Tahoe. You don't understand. It's just gravel. It just, it, it just has gone into my skin and it's just in my skin. Gravel. You never, you didn't want to fall. Not because of, you just felt like you don't know what's about to happen. I remember gravel. 
right? So we grew up in those kind of things. And I love Tahoe and I, I love it. Now, going to Tahoe is not so fun. I mean, it's the curvy roads. You know how you get up there and, and, and there are things that I, I don't, there's, not, there's some things that aren't fun getting to Tahoe. Now, how many of you know it's gotten more packed getting to Tahoe? You get in your car, and how many of you know loading four kids to get to Tahoe is so not fun? Right? So you load everybody up, and you pack the car, and you go down Sunrise. How many of you know the drive to Sunrise is like, there's like 3,000 lights? Right? It's like they keep adding lights. Right? So they, how many of you know that's not fun? There's a light, and then there's a light. And then for, if you even get to 10 miles an hour, they're like, let's add another light in case they, you, ca you catch a little bit of wind, let's add some more lights, right? And then you get to Highway 50, and then, and then it's usually packed, especially if there's a holiday, it's packed. And I don't mind that. I don't mind the traffic because I'm going to Tahoe. I'm excited. I don't mind the traffic. And I don't mind the windy road. Why? Because it's exciting. I know where I'm going. I'm excited. And how many of you know, how many of you know the moment where it starts getting really exciting? You know, it's called a little place called Placerville. It's where apples go to heaven. Do you know what I mean? So when you get to Placerville, you're like, we're almost there. You're not almost there, but it lies to you. And you have this part of you that goes, this is where Thomas Kincaid comes to live. And so you go there and you go to Placerville and you're like, and I don't even mind that part, knowing that we only, we're only halfway there, but I don't even mind that. There is a part that I hate, but it is not that part. It's not that part. And then as you begin to drive, and I get car sick. Does anybody get car sick? And I grew up getting car sick, and I remember sitting in the back seat and getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And I don't even mind that part. Even the drive, and the kids are crying, and they're getting you know, more and more antsy, and they're getting sicker. And I don't mind that. I actually don't mind driving around and the, the winding, and it's getting longer, and the kids are crying more. And, and, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, they were angels before Placerville, and now they're, they're demons. And I, I don't mind that. I don't, I don't mind that there, but there's one part that I do not like on the drive Tahoe. In fact, I don't even mind if it's snowy and it's icy on the roads. I don't even mind that part. I don't mind that my husband drives like a maniac. <laughs> he knows that I feel that way. So there is no, there's, it's, we're okay with this. We've talked about this at length with a counselor. So we're okay. I don't mind that part, but there is one part that I can not stand when it comes to driving to Tahoe. And there is one part that every time we get to this part, I, I do not want to think about it. I don't want to be there. I don't like it. I want to ignore it. I, I can feel my anxiety going up. I want to order three Starbucks. I want to put my music on. I want to take a volume. I don't, I don't want to do this part. I don't want to do this part. I want to speak in tongues loudly. I, I don't want to do this part. And it's this one part that I don't like. And there is a part in the road, there is this turn in the road that is not a turn, it is a death trap. And you turn and it's literally turns like this. And if you are in the passenger seat, you do not see the road. You look over the edge like this and you turn all the way over the, and you see your whole life flash before you since you were two, all the way till 37, which I am to yesterday. And I literally see, and I just think, hold on to the wheel, baby, and don't let go because I'm not ready to see Jesus yet. And I go all, and I hate it. And I just hold on for dear life and I don't like it. And when it's over, I just go, all right, let's get going, let's go to Tahoe. I don't like it. Why? It's a blind turn and I hate it and I don't like it. And when we're done with it, I'm done with it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I hate it. We don't use that word in our house and I will use it here. I hate it. I don't like it. Because I don't like being able to see. I don't like the fact of not being able to see where we're going. I don't like how, how tight a turn it is. I don't like the fact that I can't see the road. I don't like the fact that the car feels like it's out of control. I don't like the fact that I'm not driving. I don't like the fact, come on, that it feels like we are defying gravity. It feels like the car is not meant to drive on the road like this and something doesn't feel right about this. It feels wrong. But the only way to get to Tahoe is I have to go over that dang 
turn. That's a Greek word, dang turn. And I don't like it. And the reality is, is that the Israelites in Joshua chapter six have to go over a dang curve and without it, they don't get their promised land. And the reality is, is that God is saying, unless you take these turns, you're not gonna get your promised land and you're no longer called to be desert dwellers. You're called to be promised land owners and you're called to be owners, but you can't be a land owner unless you take six turns. And these turns are blind turns and you don't know if you're gonna make it around the turn, but you're gonna have to trust me that these turns are within my purpose. They're within my calling. They're within in my nature and I've called you to do it well but you're going to have to take the current turn and you're going to hate it probably but you're going to have to trust me because you were made to follow my word and you listen listen you you're not going to know how to make the turn very well but you but listen it's in your DNA to make the turn and you're not going to like it but 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 listen if you don't make the turn you're going to be like the little old person that hangs out in the turnout feeding their dog don't look around. So listen, <laughs> this is what happens. Take the curve, take the turn. I got a prophetic picture of some of you that I want to, I want to give you this picture and I hope you can trust this picture. I, I got a, I got a, a scene and I think some of this is gonna read where you're at in your life. And I hope that you'll kind of hear this and kind of, if I can take a little creative liberty and maybe this will speak to your season and maybe it will help you get to 2015 where you're at. That's really my hope. I know not all of you are in this season, but I'm hoping that at least the majority of you will hear this and you'll go, oh yeah, that's where I'm at and I needed this. And I really believe this is a word for some of you. I got a picture of when you're driving on a curvy mountain road. When you take a curve, you can't see what's around the corner, but you feel the momentum of the turn. There's almost a sense that you're out of control. And if you don't hold the wheel steady, you could lose control. I feel as if your lives are at a turning point and the momentum of the turn could cause you to feel out of control. Don't panic. Hold the wheel and the truth that you know and stay steady. You'll be amazed at how quick the turn happens and you'll be on your way. Turning points. Moments when God invites you into a moment of transition. A moment when things are about to change. And if you lean in and you quickly go through it, you'll be on your way, but yet you do feel out of control for the moment. And God invites us into moments where we actually feel a little out of control. We actually feel a little out of control. And we go, why do I feel out of control? I thought he's the God. Why is he like, isn't he in control? He is in control, but we can't sometimes get where we need to go without feeling a lot, little out of control. That's just the truth. The Israelites found themselves in the curve and in Deuteronomy, they got a promise in the, pa in the chapter before this. And this is what I want you to capture before I teach you a little bit this morning. The Israelites found themselves in the curve and they got a promise that was passed down to them in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 23. He said, and, and he brought us out from there. He's talking about Egypt. Remember, they're going into the promised land of Jericho, but their forefathers are giving them a promise and they're saying, look, he brought us out of Egypt that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to give to our forefathers. Here's what I want you to know. When God brings change in your life, when he brings you into transition, when he pulls you out of seasons, when he begins to move things in your life, when you begin to obey God fully, wholeheartedly, when you begin to say yes to God, when you begin to say, I'm not looking back anymore, but I'm looking forward and I'm not going to be a shoulda, 
shoulda, coulda, woulda person anymore, but I'm going forward. Here's what I want you to know. When God pulls you out, he's always pulling you in. It is without, without, it is without, uh, it is impossible for God to pull you out of something. Listen, it is impossible for God to take something from you without giving you something. Just, just let that sit in your heart for a minute, would you? I want that to sit in your heart for a minute because he loves you so much. It's impossible for God to take something from you without giving you something. God does not get, take something. He doesn't, get, he doesn't pull something from you. He doesn't remove you from something without taking it, without removing you, without pulling you, without placing you, without giving you, without putting you into somewhere that he's called you, without placing you, without positioning you into a place that he wants you to be. There is purpose in the removal there is purpose in the season. It is never to withhold from you. Look at me. It is never to withhold from you. God is not that kind of God that takes from you and then just withholds and make and just watches you. He always pulls you to give to you, but sometimes it's from glory to glory, and the two is a season. But the two is how we position ourselves, and the two is where we mess up. The two is where we fail. The two is where we lose ourselves. So God is never going to take from you without bringing you in. Secondly, out. He did not take us, he did not bring us out. He brought us out. Out means to move you from where you are. Listen, God is not going to give you something new without bringing you out. I just want you to think about that for a moment. God is not going to give you something without bringing you out of something. So you're going to have to move your little bottom. That's how we say it in our house. We don't say but yet. You're gonna have to move. You go, well, I, listen, God cannot meet you when you play video games for 15 hours a day. You go, well, I want God to interrupt me. He did, he interrupted you with salvation, but he's not gonna keep interrupting you. You're gonna have to get up from where you are and go seek him. He's, he's a gentleman. He's not, you gotta go, God, if you're taking me out, he brought you out. He brought you out that he might bring you in. So ultimately, listen, God is not, God brought you out of sin and destruction. He brought you out of addiction. He brought you out of all these areas so that he might bring you in. But part of that in is you, listen, he will not veto your free will to bring you in. That is a good word. Just smile at me. That is a good word. God will not veto your free will to get, to get you to your promise. He wants to participate with you. He is not going to be an authority figure and, and make you do anything. He loves you. He loves you. So he will wait until you surrender your free will to lead you in. Second, thirdly, God has promises he's trying to fulfill in you and through you. There's something way different when you realize that God is not trying to get you out of somewhere and he's not trying to figure out what to do with you. He has promises that he made to you. Remember, he made promises to you. God made promises to you a long time ago. From the beginning of the earth, God made promises to you. He said that he would redeem you. He said that he would set you free. He said that he would fulfill his purpose in you. He said that he would heal you. He said that he would participate with you to bring his glory to the earth. He said that he would, he would create within you a right spirit. He has promises within you. And so part of his pushing nature sometimes to put, to work within you, his glory is not that he's trying to get you out to make you do something. It's that he's like, I have an invested interest in you because I have promises I've been trying to fulfill in you. I made a promise to you 
that I'm a promise keeper. I promised you that I would give you the land. So you're gonna have to get up and walk around this land six times. And you're gonna have to get up and walk around. And I know that you're used to the desert, but you're never gonna be happy in the desert because you're not a desert dweller. You're a promised land owner. You were meant to be a land owner. You were meant to get up every morning and own something. You weren't meant to get up and put your tent up every, every day and look for manna and eat the same old bread every day and get the same old water from the rock. You weren't meant to be beggars. You weren't meant to, be, to, to, to wander and wander and be nomadic and wonder who you are and who's your people and where you're supposed to just hang out. You were meant to say, this is my land. This is milk and honey. This is who we were these are our this is why we came out of Egypt this is what we were promised this is who we are this is what I was called to you see sometimes you're listen you get so used to being dry and broken and negative and critical come on you get so used to hanging out and being it where you are that you forget that there are prom you don't know what it you forget what it's like to be in a season where promises are fulfilled You forget there is nothing more satisfying than a promise that's fulfilled. The Bible says a hope deferred makes a heart grow sick. So sometimes you get so used to your heart getting sick because it feels like everything that's happening is deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred. And I'm saying, listen, there is moments when promises get fulfilled in God. Don't forget he is a promise keeper and he will turn it all around. That is the kind of God you serve. Don't forget who you serve. He is not a God that is bound by time. He is not a God that is bound by your own limitations. He is not a God that is bound by your finances. He is not a God that is bound by your family and by your spouse. He's not a God that is bound by your economy. He's not a God that is bound by your own nature. He is a God that is bound by heaven and he will do what he can do. So I'm telling you, I'm speaking to your spirit that he will bring you out to bring you in because he loves you and he made you. He brings you in so that he can give you something. Listen, this is what he says. He brought us out from there that he might bring us in to what? To give. So here's what I want you to think about. He brings you out of places to bring you in so that he might give. Okay? So it's, he brings us out. He brought us out of the rock to bring us in to Bethel. Not because we maneuvered, manipulated, navigated, sent resumes. We didn't do any of that. God did that. We spent eight, I spent 18 faithful years serving, loving, happy, content, brought me to Bethel. Not so that I could be a workaholic, trying to navigate myself to be a speaker and do, travel the world. No, no. I was brought in to where I was to serve, be who I was, wherever I was. I was brought there so that he could give me a different part of his promise. If you, get, if, you bring, if you go out of where you are into a new season and then you try to get something where he, where he brought you into, you'll mess the whole thing up. Takes you out of a job, you go into the next job and then you become a devil there. It's not gonna be very good. You know what I'm saying. You're like, can I become a devil? No, you can't become a devil. I'm just saying, watch your theology. I'm just saying, watch yourself. It is the grace that gives us every good gift. So you become the character of God. Hold on to the character of God that when he brings you into the next season, hold true that God brought you out. Did they earn Jericho? No, they, hold, they held on. They obeyed God around the six times that they were there. They held on to the truth. They held on to what God had for them. They stood there. And then did they, did they fight the walls? Did they tear the walls down? No, they walked around six times. They did exactly what he asked them to do. They brought us out of Egypt. They brought them in around the promised land and then they stood their ground and then he gave them the land. 2015, he's bringing you out of 2014. He's bringing you into 2015. Hold your ground and watch him give. 
Come out of 2014, go into 2015, hold your ground and watch them give. I speak that over you today. So here's quickly what I want to say. Take the curve. Take the curve. Transition is a place where we go through and we come out of something and we head into something. Change is going to come no matter what. Here's what I want to say. If you're in a season of transition, you feel like God's inviting you into taking the curve, you better pack light. You better pack light. How well do big rigs take curves? Not well. Big rigs do not take curves well. They have to take it wide. They have to take it slow. It takes a long time. Some of you go, I've been in change for a long time. It's because you're trying to take everybody with you. You're trying to take your whole attitude with you. You're trying to take your whole family with you. You're trying to take your whole ministry with you. You're trying to take everything with you. And I'm just trying to ask you, are you trying to take too much with you? Sometimes when God's trying to transition you into the next season, whether it be your character, whether it be your attitudes, whether it be your ministry, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your family, whether it be your work, whatever season you're transitioning into, sometimes God will make it lean and mean. And he'll get you to a place where you go, wow, I am really lean and mean right now. Like I got, I am like, he is like, God is letting, telling me, watch that attitude, watch that mindset, watch that, watch your character, watch what you're doing. And you're like, what is going on, God? Why are you, what's going on? And God's going, cause I'm about to do something really significant. I'm about to change something in your life. And if you hold on to all of this, you're going to create a total storm around you. You're going to, you are going to crash and burn. So I need you to keep it lean and mean, not mean, you know what I'm saying? Keep it really clean. So when you make the turn, you, you do it well and fast and quick and you can make that turn well. Does that make sense? Hebrews chapter 12 verse one says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside everything that entangles us. Come on, every weight that so easily entangles us and snares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It is God's mercy, listen, it is his mercy that gives us an opportunity to get rid of things that will hurt us. It's his mercy that says, sweetheart, son, you need to get rid of that attitude. You need to get rid of that mindset. It's gonna hurt you. It's not gonna go well with you. It's gonna hurt people around you. It's gonna hurt your season of transition. You're not gonna get what you need. You may get promoted in the spirit, but you're gonna hurt a lot of people when you go into the next season. So be careful, get rid of it. Some of it's a season of growing up in the spirit. It's, it's a season of going, you know what? I have found in my own life, this is free. This isn't part of the message. I have found <laughs> that many times I have to start acting start growing in something well before I'm promoted into it. And I have to start being who I'm called to be well before anybody actually acknowledges me in that. And so many times I have to start being who I'm called to be in the moment, whether anybody acknowledges it ever. I'm gonna be who I'm called to be, whether you see that on me or not, God sees it on me. And so whether you ever see me lying or it's a big deal or you think that I'm a big deal or you think, you know, me, me, you know, putting my grocery cart back or me, you know, making sure I split the bill evenly or you making sure that I apologize or you, whether you ever see that as a big deal, I see it as a big deal because I know that one day, listen, I will stand before God and he will look at me and say, were you faithful with what I gave you? And it's more important that I lived in integrity before God, not before what anybody else ever saw I lived as. And the more Listen, it's easier to cut corners the older you get. That's just the truth. I'm not looking around. I'm just saying that. <laughs> Secondly, hold the wheel. Hold on to the wheel. What I simply meant by that is you need to hold, uh, no, no. Secondly is this, feel the momentum. I, I said this in the word. When you, when you take the curve and you see, uh, and you can't see around the corner, but you feel the momentum and the turn, and there's almost a sense that you're out of control. And if you don't hold the wheel steady, oh man, this iPad is broken. We broke it twice 
And when I hold that one piece, it all just goes, it goes to hell and back. Hold on just a minute. Jesus saved my iPad. Amen. There we go. Okay. Uh, it's almost a sense that you're almost out of control. And if you don't hold the wheel steady, you can lose control. I feel as if your lives are at a turning point and the momentum of the turn could cause you to feel out of control. Don't panic. Here's what I want to say. When you begin to feel the momentum of turn in your life, Joshua gave all of them an instruction. This is what he said to them. He added an instruction that God did not give him. And God gave him liberty to add this instruction. This is the crazy part. God is so cool that God said, Joshua, you can be a leader and I'm actually gonna let you add this instruction, which I think is kind of amazing. God, Joshua looked at all of them and, he's, and he gave the exact instruction, Joshua chapter six. He goes to them and he gives them the verbatim what God told him. He told them, this is what we're gonna do. Six days, seven days, we're gonna shout, da, da. But also, here's what I want you to do. Shut your mouth. Don't talk. Don't talk, keep your mouth quiet, walk around the city and don't say a word. Why did he tell him not to do that? Look at Joshua chapter six, verse 10. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, don't raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Why did he say that? Because in the New Testament, it said that the Israelites were left in the desert for 40 years because of their grumbling and complaining. Now, obviously he's talking to the men. Ob I mean, obviously, those men, he's saying, listen, they were, they were kept, no, they were kept in the desert because of their unbelief, right? Their unbelief, their unbelieving hearts. But it said they were kept there because they were complaining. They were griping. They were talking. They were just, they were flapping their mouths. They were, they were complaining. And what Joshua was saying is, listen, I love all of you, but I am not going to stay in the desert for 40 more years because you can't keep your trap shut. Your trap, your trap, that's good. Can't keep your trap shut any longer. I, I, I don't want to be here because you just want to complain. You want to vent. You want to tell your, your friends that you're tired of marching around this city six more times. What are we doing, Joshua? Why are we doing it? I'm tired too. My feet hurt too. I know. All we keep doing is eating bread. How are you making manna? Well, I'm making manna casserole. Like, I mean, could you imagine? He's like, I love you, all of you, but shut up. Shut your mouth and do what we, I, I love you, but I want this land. I want this land. I'm, there is a promise in my heart and I'm not going to let you take it from us. So if everyone will just be quiet and listen, when we feel the momentum of change, listen, listen, the enemy would love nothing more than to make an alliance with your mouth. The Bible says that life and death is in the power of the mouth. And part of the Greek meaning of that, which means that when you speak, there is power in the mouth. And that word actually means that the mouth, that the words that you speak are living they continue to live until they're interrupted by something else. Just follow me on this. So when you say something like, I'm so stupid, I can't get it together. I know no one's ever said that in this room, but imagine that word continues to live on until it's interrupted by something else. So you just saying, well, I'm so stupid, I can't do anything, that continues to live on and bear fruit and bear fruit and bear life and continues to live within you and live outside of you until you say something like, I'm a new creation, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and until, listen, you believe more of what you say statistically, scientifically and biblically than what anybody else says about you. So I can't sit with you and go, no, you're so cute. You're so awesome. You're such a good mom. You're doing so great. Did you know that, that you rarely believe what I say about you? You can believe for a little bit, but I don't hang out with you. And you talk to yourself more than anybody else talks to you. So I can hang out with you for 20 hours, but you're hanging out with yourself for 24 hours. And so what you're saying to yourself is absolutely very, very important. It's life-changing. So your ability to say truth over yourself is very, very important. It's powerful. It's a make or break moment over your life, over your life. So your ability, so when you say things over yourself, 
It's very damaging or positive. It's very powerful what we say with our mouth. So he is saying, be quiet, don't say anything. And when we feel the momentum of change, sometimes the agitation, listen, just like giving birth, how many of you as a pregnant woman, I am so sick of being this big. I, I am a walrus. I don't wanna do this, I don't like this, I'm uncomfortable. I don't, now I, some of you pregnant women loved it and we forgive you, but some of us, I, I did not like being pregnant. It was not fun. I felt sick almost the entire time and I, I didn't like it. And, and the, the bigger I got, the more I didn't like it. The more it was like, this is horrible. I did it four times, so obviously there was a payoff. But I didn't like it. And, and this is what he's saying is, we're almost about to have the baby. We're walking around. Do you think that they were done? We've been here for 40 years and you're gonna make us walk around this city six times and, say, and you want us to do nothing. We're not gonna fight. We're, not, we're, we're warriors, we're ready to get the city. We're ready to have transition and you want us to do nothing. We can't even yell. We can't even raise our voices. Could you imagine? I mean, they're done. Don't be surprised if the season you're in, you wanna say something. And here's what I wanna say. Don't sometimes what God is asking you to do. This was a holy moment for them. Walking around this city was a holy moment. They're about to get their promised land. And sometimes we're so eager to talk to God about all of our problems. And I would just suggest maybe we should be more eager to hear the God who can set worlds in motion, who can speak light into existence, maybe we should be leaning in and wanting to hear what he has to say more than dumping everything about what we have to say on him. Just suggesting that it might be time when we are in this moment to say, God, what are you saying? I've said enough. What are you saying? I'll just be quiet and do exactly what you asked me to do. I'll be quiet and I'll march around the city six times. And when you say shout, I'll give it all I got. But I'm going to hold this wheel and I'm not going to let it move. And I'm going to hold on to what you said to do. Because everything within me says this is not going to work. But you said within my God DNA, this is going to work. And I trust you. Lastly, Hold the truth, hold the wheel. The Bible says your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Holding the wheel of truth that you know and stay steady, you'll be amazed at how quick the turn happens and you'll be on your way. Sometimes when you hit this moment of momentum, the worst part is right before breakthrough. I've learned that in my life. When you just about say, I cannot take it anymore. And it's not a heart of anger. It's not a heart of offense. It's not a heart of, I, of, I, of giving up. It's not because you haven't persevered. There are moments when literally it's, it's like when you're about to have a baby, I'm done. I cannot push anymore. Forgive me for the female expression. Men, you'll just have to get over it. You hear from guys most of the time. So just go with me. I have a picture. No, listen, I, listen. <laughs> I cannot do this anymore. There is moments in your spiritual life when you just go, I cannot do this anymore. And I want you to know that's really normal and you've done nothing wrong. Sometimes you're about to have a breakthrough and I wanna encourage you, just hold on. Hold on to that wheel and just hold on to the truth and say, God, you know what you're doing, I trust you. And sometimes just take a deep breath and literally think to yourself, the car knows what it's doing. I'm just gonna hold on to the wheel. I, I, and sometimes, and I was listening to David, last night I was talking to David, and he's a trauma nurse and he said, in the midst of a, in a trauma, when somebody gets in a spin, he said, he said sometimes when you're in the midst of a really intense spin out, he said, if you are in the midst of, in front of a spin out and you're seat belted in, he said, you're in the safest part of the spin out. Sometimes is when you're in the midst of it. He said, when a car is, is doing this and you're in the middle of it, he said, actually you're in the safest part because you're in the momentum of it. 
and you're strapped into the, the force of it. And I would say some of you right now, you're in the force of that. And I would say, don't move, hold on to the force of the spin out. And God knows exactly what he's doing and let the force of his presence and what he's asking you to do, hold on to the truth that you know that he's the one that began a good thing in you and he is in charge of finishing it. Amen. I'll just say that to your spirit. If he began it, he's in charge of finishing it. If he brought you out of it, he's in charge of bringing you into it. So hold the truth. He will not take something from you without giving you something. He is responsible for that. Don't go find something. Don't go try to make it work. Don't try to force something. Trust him. God, my hands are open. You get, you took it from me. Now you give it to me. I'm not going to try to give, make something fit. I'm going to just leave it into your hands. So I would say some of you right now, you're going into the spin. Get ready, trust God, get your heart ready. You cannot resist change, change. Some of you are in the middle of it and you're like, I feel like I'm in a panic, what's happening? Listen, you can't, you can take a turn out, you can stop for a minute, but you're gonna have to, you're not, you, you can't, you gotta get back in the race, you gotta start, finish the transition. You, just because you stop doesn't mean that you're not gonna make it to the summit if you just hang out in the turnout. I love you, but you can't be the old person that hangs out in the turnout. I love you, don't look around. And then secondly, some of you have crashed and burned in the turnout, like in, the, in, the, in it. You just crashed and burned and you're sitting in a ditch and you're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm saying, I love you. You got to get back on the road and you got to finish out. And some of you are, are actually coming out of it. And you're in this season of like, I just went through massive transition. Praise God. You just came right out of it and you made it. And guess what? Those turns will never hold fear over you again because now you know you made it and you can rejoice. And this whole season of December is about rejoicing and knowing that 2015 is never gonna have the fear that 2014 had over you. You lost your job, but you made it. Your health, you made it. Come on, the doctor's office, listen, the doctor's office is not gonna hold the same fear. The, the bankruptcy is not gonna hold the same fear. Your kids are not gonna hold the same fear. You are still standing. The cross of Christ was enough to sustain you. And that's enough, amen? Lord, we love you today. We love you today. We thank you for your grace that's in the room. We thank you for your grace that's in the room. Lord, we just pray for uh, an anointing to come right now. Lord, I, I feel like even with the holidays, Lord, there can be such a, a uniqueness of, of season. Lord, I feel like even on my feed, my Facebook feed, I can see one moment someone saying, I miss you, dad. I wish you were here. And the next moment it's, look at, it's baby's first Christmas. And it feels so unique. And I know that some of us like we're excited because it's like, yay, 2015, I want to wash 2014 off and pray it never comes back. And some of us are like, I don't want to say goodbye to 2014 because I, I don't really know if I can go to 2015. And I, I know that we want to take the curve, God, because we can't get away from the curve. We know that if you brought us out, you're going to bring us in. Our core belief is that you are a good God. Lord, you are a good God. I believe that. I believe, I believe you are good and your goodness is without boundary. Let's take a moment right now. Take a deep breath, if you would. This is the most important moment today in your whole day is you just get to talk to the God who created you, loves you, knows you, is without limit. He loves you. He knows you. He's not overwhelmed by your life. He's not, he's not disappointed. He's not wondering what he's going to do with you. He's not wondering about your kids. He's not concerned. He knows that he is enough. Some of you today, you say, Havala, I can see I'm in the curve. The curve is coming my way. 
and I'm battling fear. I sense fear in my life. I, I can feel it coming. I know I need to make a change and the season's coming to a head and I find myself wishing that I was brave. I wish I was courageous. I wish that I was that Joshua who said, let's march around the city. And yet I'm that one that is wondering if we have what it takes. And I don't wanna be that guy. I don't wanna be that girl. I wanna be the one that says, let's march on the city. Let's take the ground. And I wanna be that one. And I just wanna say today, I'm gonna choose faith. I'm gonna choose hope. I'm, I'm gonna choose courage. If that's you, I want you just to gently lift your hand, say, that's me. I'm coming into the curve and I need faith. I love that. Thank you for your honesty. I love that. You may slip your hand down. Some of you today, you've been in a spin out and you've given up. You, you stopped. You realized like my whole life, we got into the curve and I panicked. I didn't know what to do. I hated it. I didn't, I began to lose my job. I lost my marriage. I, everything has been kind of in this spin out and I gave up. I pulled over. I, I panicked and I, I have, I have been checked out of life. I've been checked out of my marriage. I've been checked out of my finances. I've been checked out of my pursuit of God. I've been checked out of what I need to do and I know I need to get back in the game. I know it and I realize that no one is gonna get me there. I need to get up and get back in the game. I need to take the curve. I need to rise up and I need to be who I'm called to be. If that's you, just lift your hand and say, that's me, I admit it. I gotta get back in the game. I gotta get back in the game. Thank you, thank you for your honesty. Some of you today, you're saying, Havala, I am in the thick of the curve and I am, I am like, my car is going end over end over end, but I, am, I know that there is grace for it. I know I'm in the middle of it and I'm, I just believe God's gonna get me through this, but I just, I just feel like I'm in the midst of this like spin out and I just want to say like, I just need endurance for the spin out. Like I just need endurance for the spin out. I, I don't feel like I'm getting beat up, but I, yet I feel that I, if I was to move even an inch from where I'm at, I'm not sure I'd be okay. So I just need grace to sustain for the moment where I am. If I just, I just need to stick close to the cross and I cannot move an inch. I just need to be quiet. I need to not grumble. I need to not complain. I need to be quiet and march and sit and watch what God's about to do. I need to guard my heart and my mouth for the moment I'm in. If that's you, just lift your hand and say, that is exactly where I'm at. I love that. Good. Excellent. Excellent. And then lastly, there are some of you that say, Havala, I just came out of transition and I am here to give God praise because without it, man, I was, I was, I can look back and it was such a dark moment, but yet with his grace, he got me out. And I am so grateful. It is a season of praise for me. Just lift your hand and say, that's me. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. If you, if you raised your hand, will you all just stand with me for a minute? And that was the majority of us. If you raised your hand for any of those, let's stand together. I love that. Let's lift our hands to heaven as a sign of surrender for a moment. Let's say this, Lord Jesus, we love you. We give you praise today. We thank you that you own the curve. We thank you that you are in charge, that you are who you say you are, and you will do what you say you will do. We thank you that we are who you say we are, and we can do what you say we can do. We ask you for grace in the moment. We ask you for grace in the season. We thank you for a God that sustains. We thank you for a God that gives. We thank you for a God that loves in the moment of need and in the God who loves us in plenty. 
We give you our lives. We give you our season. We give you the curve. And we love you today. We receive from you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.